You're listening to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. One half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. Welcome to the Stats Bomb Football Podcast. I am your host, Seth Partnow. Uh, I am joined today, as usual, by uh, CEO and founder, Ted Knudsen. I thought we were going to the coach today first. Now you've all like messed me up. I wasn't ready. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, well, let's go, let's go next to the coach, Matt Edwards, uh, and get right off the bat with what is your Baja Blast of the week? Uh, today's Baja Blast of the week is that it's Pi Day. I know this probably won't come out today, but it is Pi Day, March 14th. And there are all sorts of great deals relating to pizzas or pie. Mm-hmm. Full large pizza at 7-Eleven for $3.14. I'm sorry, did also, you say at 7-Eleven? 7-Eleven. Also, Mexican pizzas at Taco Bell. Taco Bell, Baja Blast. There you go. $3.14. I, I want to ask a question about the pizza at 7-Eleven because I know that you are a frequent visitor to 7-Elevens. I have seen you come back with the world's largest beverages that have actually blown English people's mind about this. Is it a thing that you should be eating? Or is it something that is better off avoided no matter what the price? I mean, it's pizza, so you should be eating it. Uh, uh, but it's definitely not the best pizza I've ever had. But no, it's not no, the no, worst. no, no, no. It's not the worst. I've had some bad pizzas. Is it is it pizza that you would pay for right now? $3.14, yeah. Okay. What's your favorite pie that's not a pizza? Probably banana cream. Whoa. Way out there. Somehow that tracks. Um wrangling us back to the hang world on no of, partner no. You've, got, you've got to answer this question what's your favorite pie that's not a pizza oh pumpkin pie pumpkin pie is Ooh, excellent pumpkin. that's that's also like way out there on the honestly like thanksgiving is the only time of the year i actually eat pie and so pumpkin this, pie. this feels substandard I, the, it feels like you need to actually up your rate of pie consumption there so when we were at the combine last week they had a peanut butter pretzel pie that i partook of were you proud to partake of the peanut butter pretzel pie? Exactly. Much like the peculiar purple pie man of Porcupine Peak. <laughs> this is a this is an especially <laughs> rough start. <laughs> no, what are, you, what are you talking about? This is great. You brought um, up Pie Day as the Baja Blast. Come on, where are we at? That's fair. Um, so we're gonna talk about a position that either matters a great deal or not at all, depending on who you ask today. Uh, and that is the running back position. So, Matt, I'll come to you. Do running backs matter? I I don't know which side I get to be on today. Ted's on one side. I'm on the other. I am going to go with running backs definitely are a important part of an offense. And they matter to have a very good, well-established offensive identity. Um, To me, I think that the biggest thing is not necessarily a positional do running backs matter or do they not matter. It's really about what your individual running back skills are and i think that is how you deploy them is going to be the bigger question it's not do they matter or do they not matter it's what are you actually doing with the skill level and talent of your running backs you look at some of the running backs assigned this week like derrick henry he is going to be used a lot different than christian mccaffrey was or saquon barkley I think it really all comes down to how they're utilized, if they actually matter or not. And I think a lot of the discussion on if they matter or not is about the price at which they are being paid. And so that's that's the bigger question is not do running backs matter or not, but how do their contracts fit into what you're doing overall in the NFL level? And then in college, you know, there are no official contracts, but NIL wise, where does that fit into your broader NIL bucket. Also, what are you going to be doing scheme-wise as there's a big, vast difference schematically at the college level? So I would like to note that Matt and I don't have to be opposed on any particular thing. This is not that type of, of show. Um, and also, while I'm on, on the topic of Matt's takes here, this man has just admitted that he would eat a 7-Eleven pizza. So like, there's some questionable elements of his opinions already here. Nevertheless, I would like to state my perspective, which is that I think that this is is changing dramatically and it, it literally could change year to year. Um, one of the things that I wanted Matt to, to comment about in um, when we were doing our prep was how does the value of running backs in the running game change 
when you see uh, sort of a lot of cover three versus more two high looks in the league sort of base defense structure. Because we've seen a lot more two high uh, last year and then a little bit the year before as the league sort of adjusts back to trying to contain a lot of the the deep passing games and, and those problems there. I think that that is, is something that significantly impacts the, the, the value of a running back. And we'll get to that in a little bit. I think the other thing that, that we're looking at here is obviously you've got different types of running backs. How do they fit into your scheme is important. But the thing that Matt said last about the, the contract, what we found over time is that offensive line play has a lot of impact on, on running backs, much more so than, than your average running back does. Um, which I think is a, a significant learning. And the other bit is durability of running backs. Like it is a tough league and these guys get beat all the time. And, you know, it used to be like certain backs, you just feed them and you let them go. Like just let the man eat. And eventually you end up with, you know, a hundred yard rushing game. That's not how it works anymore. And especially not over five year contracts, you need to be really careful about, you know, managing your resources. Can, is this guy mostly replaceable? Or not. Now there are some backs that I don't think you know fit that profile. Some backs are huge outliers and, and very valuable. Um, so I I think that running backs can matter. They definitely matter more in college than they do in in the NFL. Um, and the NFL has changed a lot in how they pay these guys and what sort of contracts they offer them because of their learnings around what we just covered. So I think that dovetails a little bit with the question you asked Matt about how sort of in, in your background in magic and mine in poker, uh, what you might call the competitive meta of, of the game as what the average team does defensively changes. I think what we're really talking about is relative to other positions, uh, which ha obviously if some positions increase in relative value through study, others decrease and what we've seen is is as uh you know certain positions you mentioned offensive line matt has talked about the importance of receivers being able to get separation or not the running back has relatively devalued uh, according to that now sort of uh, a question that i think dovetails with yours about the difference in sort of uh secondary play is is that something that can change um you know we're, we're kind of in an era in the nba where because teams have been going small for so long kind of is the big man back is, is is sort of a question because it's sort of this is unusual therefore it's effective so i'm wondering is there an element of that is there a certain type of running back that is the derrick henry big bruising running back relatively more valuable because uh defenses have sort of you know speed and covering deep and stuff like that more i think there's a, a lot of value to that in that the game is cyclical um and i think it it fits seth with your example of kind of the big man having a i don't know return to prominence in the nba but having a a bigger role than in the past couple of seasons where we will reach a, a tipping point and I think we're starting to see some of that with what Ted was talking about. The defensive structure is you see a lot more dime defenses where it's six defensive backs on the field, you know, cover two, kind of have a deep shell four stuff underneath. And if you get that type of defensive look, you're going to be able to take advantage in the run game. And I think that offenses is all about maximizing, you know, first downs to yards, basically. And at some point, you know, running the ball is going to be just as effective um, as the pass game because of the defensive structure limiting big plays in the passing game. You look at the Chiefs, you know, their depth of target has decreased every year for the past three seasons, you know, where their pass game is no longer 10, 15, 20 yard chunks. It's eight yards to Travis Kelsey here you know, a pass to a running back there in, you know, again, another area where running backs might be beneficial is it's not just their ability to run the ball, but also their ability in the pass game. But screens, as we get these changes, screens are yeah. passes that are running plays. And Andy Reid is one of the best schemers of screen screens in the world. Right. And always yeah. has been. Uh, the other thing you see is, is 12 and 13 personnel, like on the rise. Right. So you're like, yeah, if you go, you go six defensive backs, like you're going to have to now deal with, you know, 12 and 13 personnel in a league that's devalued linebacker play because it's sort of, sort of confusing and you, it can't, it can't adapt as quickly on a year to year personnel basis as this, you might be able to, 
to say, hey, this is what we want to be able to play. But unless you get the right guys that are still at elite level, you can't play that in the same way. So you're sort of making with slightly mismatched toys in the in the roles that you need to have. Um, I, I think that those those are pretty intriguing. But one of the things about the running game that I think the analytics has taught us a lot is we used to argue, uh, and actually uh, I think Timo Risk uh, was one of the people that I, I saw do this from PFF Data Science uh, a couple of years ago. It used to be like, oh yeah, well, a successful play is, is four yards on first down, right? Four or more yards on first down. And the reality is like six yards on first down is, is the important level to feel like it's successful because of all the things that happen after that. And you very rarely end up with that six yard rush on first down in the NFL. And so when you look at it from that perspective, now you've suddenly reevaluated all of your play calling. Like, how do we get that six yards on first down? How do we only have a first and second? Because third down's a problem. Like third down is the problem down. You don't ever want to be in a third down situation if you can help it. Uh, or, you know, many teams, uh, and, and we talked a little bit on the, the panel at Sloan, now have gone to game managers where they understand in any particular situation, given their, their position on the field, this is what our play calls are going to look like in third and fourth down. Right. And so they can actually move forward in the in the probability matrix around that. But because the valuation of different spots and we've got EPA to be able to look at that uh, expected points is something we used to do back in the gambling space, you know, a decade ago to try and understand the different uh, levers that you're looking at in, in late game situations. But because we understand that a little bit better. That has definitely changed how you call plays and how you call plays now impacts the different personnel groupings that you're looking at. Um, I think the, the thing that also gets lost in the offense versus defense thing is the offense is mostly taking what the defense gives them, right? Like, Tell me more about your perspective on that and game planning and how that works in teams. Yeah, I like to think of game planning on the offensive side as an art and on the defensive side it's a science where defensively you're game planning based on very specific tendencies, personnel groupings down a distance. It's very scientific. And on the offensive side, it's, you know, we have some of these things that we think the defense might do if we align this way. So we're going to try and do, you know, X or instead of Y. I used, you know, math variables when I'm talking about art, we're going to do red instead of green. Uh, but I think that the aspect of offensively you have some general thoughts and things that you are trying to accomplish and you don't know what the defense is going to line up to because they're adjusting to you and so your your game plan and what you're trying to do is a lot more like you're talking about where it's you know we're we're kind of taking what the defense is giving us we line up in a formation maybe we have a deep pass called if you're a good offense, you're going to give your quarterback the ability to audible out of that if that's not going to be a good play for you. So you can get up, line up, take what the defense gives you. You see these college teams that will line up really fast and then everybody looks over to the sideline. I think that's the perfect example of taking what the defense gives you. You line up, this is what the defense is lined up in, look over, then your offensive coordinator calls a play. Most of the time, they don't even have a play called. They're just lining up really fast to see what, they, what the defense is going to do. And the coach is like, all right, they're in this set. Let's call this. And so if you so get that's a also that's, giving that's you a, a lot of slice. That's a critical yeah. slice in your, your game planning, but also your analysis, right? What do they do when they're in tempo versus what are they doing like, you know, when, when the defense has time to set for it? And and some some teams and some offensive rooms that you're in, like they want to be in tempo as much as possible. And when they're not in tempo, they know that they're much more up against the wall. Like it's much more challenging for them to call plays this is the fun of the game, right? This is the chess or I, I think when, when Seth and I have talked about the defensive side of the ball, it feels like blackjack or limit poker. And then the other side of it feels like, you know, a different game. Uh, and you can, you can paint and you can be artistic. But I also think that one of the things that, that you've talked about before is you want to make it as easy as possible for your quarterback to understand the important things for them that they're getting out of looking at that defense. And sometimes that comes out of motion. Sometimes that comes out of, you know, jet. Sometimes that comes out of a particular alignment. That you're like, all right, this guy's aligned here in this position. That means that this is most likely this particular defense. And so that then dictates my first read, my second read, or my RPOs as well. Like who is my read on this to be able to, to see the RPO? Um, anyway, I, I, like we're kind of deep into, into tactical discussions here because you have to be in order to talk about the running back position. Yeah, I think an interesting aspect is really 
you, you talked a little bit about tactics on third and fourth down and game management. You look at the Eagles and what they've done with the tush push on fourth and one, basically being, you know, automatic, it's 92% or whatever they talk about on new heights, but not, you know, not every team's going to have a Jalen hurts at quarterback, but let's say you have a Derrick Henry in the Baltimore Ravens, you know, they're, they're a team that is aggressive on fourth down and they just added one of the bigger backs in the NFL. That is an effective short down rusher. I think we can all assume based on all of this that their percentage of times they go for it on fourth down is going to be increased. I mean, you think about Lamar Jackson on the edge, Derrick Henry Patrick, up the middle. Patrick Ricard. Like they are going to be a really good short yardage team with their offensive setup. Now you also have to worry it, about the pop pass now, too. Like so yeah. the, they they run a lot of tight end sets, like multi-tight ends, and you get that, oh, it's fourth and one, it's tight, everything's bundled, and then suddenly one of those tight ends are going over the top, and you got 300 pound Patrick Card mm-hmm. who can block, but suddenly he has, has a pretty good hair, pair of hands on that. You don't want to see that in any way, shape, or form if you're a defensive back. Yeah. So I think it, it'll be interesting to watch them and how they deploy Derrick Henry. You know, the the backs that got signed, I think, fit really well schematically with the teams that they've signed with these free agent contracts. So let, let's talk about that, um, Be both with, with respect to free agency and the draft. With this changing in the understanding of the position, combined with the fact that, we, as we talked about earlier, uh, separating kind of running back skill from context, whether that scheme or offensive line play is is a challenge, how do we go about identifying, oh, he's a good fit for this scheme because he does this well? That's a tough question for, for any sport. Well, any that's scheme. why you're here. You <laughs> <laughs> what, what I think you can do is as an offense, you have an identity. And this identity can vary and change year over year, but you have things that you like to do. Andy Reid is a coach that likes to pass the ball. You know, I think Mike Leach was a great example of someone that liked to throw the ball. Uh, but then there are also guys that like to run the ball. And so you have things that you generally want to do. We want to be able to get into 21, 22 personnel, run power, run this type of run game. You have that kind of mindset going in. And then with the advent of tracking data or other data, you're able to look in depth at all of the possibilities, free agency, draft, How do they do in these specific scenarios that we are going to want to put them into? You know, in the past, it would be you'd have to watch hours and hours of film and and you'd maybe get 10 plays that fit what you're wanting to look for specifically. But now with the advent of and the increased ability to get data, tie it to video, you're able to quickly identify very specific things that you're going to look for by position, watch those things and see how they fit into your scheme. And I think the ability to turn data into football knowledge is the big key there in that the the data is there, whether it's, you know, through our tracking data or our eventing data and the ability to turn that data into football terms that makes sense to coaches, talent evaluators, whoever it is, that can help make that process so much faster and quicker and give people more better information to make these more informed decisions. Give me a specific example or two of of something like that with respect to a running back and their proposed fit. So I think it, one example is from this um, most recent draft. So not the 2024 draft, but 2023. You know, you had B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs. And Jameer Gibbs is a running back who started at Georgia Tech you know, had a good couple of years and ended up transferring to Alabama. Uh, And he was a running back that was actually utilized a lot in the passing game, like had really good hands, was able to fit a very specific identity. Um, You know, the Detroit Lions obviously liked what they saw and and they picked him and and have utilized him in that way. You know, they already had, uh, who was it, David Montgomery, I think there. Uh, But they saw that they could use Jameer Gibbs in this kind of extra role, get him some passes, get him some touches and let him grow into kind of a a more broad role for them. Um, And so I think that's a a really good example of a team identifying, hey, we like this runner because he can do these things. Um, And and he seemed to to fit really well this year for them. So I have a 
one from this year that I'm intrigued by, and I don't really have a, a straight answer on it, but like Saquon's trending is not good uh, versus like what he was doing before. And you're like, he looks like a very average back. Um, but one of the things that you can do is you can be like, well, the Giants are a bit of a mess in, in polite terms, especially you know, in, in recent years, they, they snuck into the playoffs one year, but like, if you look at the overall, like, yeah, it was a, it's, they've not been great. And so when you look at Saquon, you're like, all right, we know that he's had some issues with injuries. Um, you can take the physical data that you're getting in the tracking sense and be able to, to then kind of project that better as to would he perform in a similar way to his earlier years, uh, in a different offense, like one that was a little more coherent than, and possibly had a bit more talent. And so that's that's one area that you can help adjust some risk, because if you don't have that, you're just looking at the trending. And you're like, I'd rather take like you know Bijan or or like honestly almost any other back and not have to pay them a ton of money in free agency to to produce the exact same stuff that he was getting out of the Giants. And I think that that's actually kind of the the crucial sort of uh, lever that you're looking at. Seth, give me an example from the NBA where you're looking at the the absence of a thing so the absence of, of big man play and that's partly because the you know the the style has been dictated that this is more superior in this way and you presumably you've got a threshold for if this big man is a good enough passer but also you know pretty dominant down low you can find a way to make that plus ev over time especially because you know threes and dunks if you have a guy that get dunks all the time, then threes potentially open up for you as well, right? Like, wh- how's that work out? And what are you looking for to be able to evaluate that? Um, I think the the way the game has developed with with sort of switching defense, especially, is sort of the almost the swing skill is that ability to, all right, they put a small guy in him, you can take him down inside and put him in the basket. Um, I think that sort of the first wave of stretch bigs were basically like tall, slow, small forwards in that you put a small guy on him and you tried to post the guy up and he was useless. Uh, but they then were Europeans. Sort of, uh, no, it was, it was, you know, Brad Lowhouse or, or, or something like that. To, to Tony Kukoc, like, uh, who's, who's the other guy like on, on Orlando when, uh, the other Van Gundy was playing a, a top, oh, uh, 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 Richard Lewis. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 uh, yeah. And so I think the, the difference has been, you know, the, the, um, I mean, I'll, I'll say one that's close to home. Like one of the things about Brooke Lopez was, okay, he can shoot threes, but he's also seven foot, 280 pounds and very agile. And you put a six, three guy on him and okay, well, I'm just going to stand right near the basket and drop the ball in is, is an option also. Um, so I think that that sort of became the swing skill. And if you know, not to get dive too deep into this year's NBA, but part of the reason the Celtics are so interesting this year is that's something that Kristaps Porzingis has improved improved on. Uh, a couple of years ago in Dallas, uh, Porzingis post ups were bad, even against switches. And now that's actually a very valuable weapon, and that does something for an offense that that you know that that that. E- you're you're maybe you're giving up a quickness advantage on one end, but you're getting an advantage back on the other end, and you think you come out ahead in that. Um, and I th- so I think that's been the difference that that we we've seen in, in sort of the big man coming back. Yeah, I think it's again it speaks part of the fun about this podcast is we can speak across a couple different sports. Like you know you can talk about the soccer space and um, kind of dominant or or disruptive strategies. So for a couple of years, like Allardyce and Pulis especially had these giant guys and they would hammer down on the box and do do set pieces and um, at Stoke you had Rory Delap like doing long throws into the box and and chucking it in uh, on on the on a line. Like this guy was awesome at it. And and you would have you know multiple say four or five guys above six foot two that are crashing the box every single time. And Stoke one year scored, I think like eight goals off of long throws, like eight goals off of long throws. It was obscene. They had 15% of their total shot volume from long throws alone. It took, I think three or four years for the good teams in the league to start to figure out, Oh, if we put four center backs in our lineup, when we're play, playing those two teams, we're going to disrupt them a lot. And it, they don't actually do anything that causes us too many problems because they don't have a lot of wing attacking play that, that makes the, us break down there. And so they started to do that. And the other thing, the problem was there were like four teams at the time that had the same sort of strategy and the same sort of style. And if you've got four teams in the Premier League, you know you're going to face 
uh, regularly, you can start to carry an extra player that fits in with that because you're going to need to actually combat against it. This is, again, sort of the too high look versus cover three linebackers versus, you know, your your sixth defensive back and stuff like that. I, I think that it plays a lot into this. And one of the things that gets lost in the offseason commentary about, oh, this is a great free agent signing or this is that signing or this is that you don't actually know what their plan is and they're not going to tell you what their plan is. <laughs> so, so you're kind of guessing based off of last year's plan or hoping that, you know, what next year's plan might be, but it might be that they, you know, especially the Ravens, like the Ravens have changed their, their offensive style a bit over the last couple of years and they changed their offensive coordinator as well. So we'll see, you know, in, in some of these cases, I'm like, I'm skeptical of that, but I think the, the Eagles are pretty smart. So we'll see what they end up doing with Saquon. I mean, the, the analogy seems fairly straightforward in that, you know, Matt, you mentioned sort of the Jameer Gibbs out of the backfield, what used to be like, quote unquote, the third down back, right? As the pass game has has maybe gained prominence, but maybe what we're asking is the is the big bruiser who is going to, you know, if you're only playing one linebacker is going to run your defense over. Is that something that that is that is possibly coming back? And then the the add on question to that is, how many of those guys are there that can actually do that at an NFL level? I think the running back mattering in, in college is there's there's a much bigger differentiation, whereas the NFL, basically anyone who's getting playing time is good enough to get playing time, and there's less differentiation there. Yeah, you look at you know one of the top running backs in college that's coming out in the draft is Blake Corum, and he's 5'8", I think. You know, he's got some weight to him, but... Uh, there's a, a big difference between that and Derrick Henry, who's six, two or three, you know, 200 and whatever pounds. The the picture of Derrick Henry at the <laughs> National Championship with Mark Ingram. Well, I will laugh every time. There are like a few pictures that get me sports related. That one, the picture of Frank Beamer holding his hands up as it goes to overtime tied zero to zero is the other one. No, it's. It, I'm laughing because it's sort of like the uh, the difference between Tom Cruise and Alan Richson as uh, as Jack Reacher <laughs> yeah. is 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 sort of what is the body type difference we're talking about. So I'm thinking of a different one in that you get Derrick Henry, and I'm remembering Quentin Griffin and his size. Right, like Quentin Griffin was uh, what was it, like five foot seven, come out of Oklahoma. He was built like a bowling ball, and he was about the same height as a bowling ball as well. But he was part of that Denver Broncos uh, set of running backs that used to be able to put up thousand yard or multi thousand yard seasons. That was an offensive line element about it. Derrick Henry is not that type of back. Like Derrick Henry feels like he's going to you know make you pay for it regularly. In fact, maybe he's done that too much in his career. Uh, but he's had a good long uh, availability span, and and uh, and you know particularly for that type of back, he's had a long career. Yeah. <laughs> Quick aside. So my wife did a photo shoot for Nike strength and Derrick Henry was there. And my wife is five, three. And I said, Derrick Henry is just be prepared. He is gigantic. And uh, so she, she went and prepared and still came home and was like, Oh yeah, he is, he is huge. Uh, so, and it's interesting, I think to look at the, the running backs that are coming up in the draft right now versus the running backs that just signed free agent contracts you know, some of the top running backs, like we said, are Blake Corum, who's, you know, fairly small, Bucky Irving, who's also pretty small, where you have more of these kind of shiftier type backs, where it, it does seem like they aren't really fitting maybe that that bigger running back look that teams are looking for at this point. And this could be the latest we get uh, the first running back off the board ever. You know, there are no running backs projected in the first round. I think that's happened maybe twice in the past and it might be third round, even late second round, third round before we see a running back taken. And I think that's why some of these free agent deals were so big and, and the number of people that changed teams shortage. Yeah. And so we what? saw, I think the four biggest free agent running back contracts in, of the past, like 10 years between Josh Jacobs, Derek Henry, Saquon Barkley. And I think, um, I, I can't remember who the other one was, but Mixon basically got a move because he was good enough that yeah. uh, he was going to get cut. But somebody's like, "Well, he's better than what we see in the draft right now, so we might as well." Yeah. I got, so, question about that: um, What position are the guys who used to become Derrick Henry? 
maybe not Derrick Henry because he's somewhat singular, but but that sort of size of player, what position are they playing now? If they're, if, if they're, <laughs> like because that's is, yeah. is it yeah. is it that simple that because that the ed, ed, edge rushers are, are are a position we've recognized as more important and a difference maker and therefore gets paid? Is it Ex- is explosive, fast, fast freaks that have weight? Right, like that's yeah. that's what yeah. you're looking for. And and yeah, it used to be that those guys would would sort of line up in the backfield, but then they've devalued that, that position. It's it's almost it's definitely not linebacker as much. Um, you know, you could have some safeties that are, have a similar body style, but again, like it's just a different different job. So yeah, it's it's probably edge. Yeah, they probably and they'll put on a little bit more weight as they're playing edge rusher, right? They still have to play, you know, run defense against tackles who are trying to block them. Uh, you know, there's a difference between you know, Will Anderson and uh, Chase Young, you know, weight-wise. And, you know, the schematic difference, outside linebacker in a 3-4, you know. Defensive both of those Michigan three. both those Michigan backs benefited from an awesome offensive line, right? And so, like, that makes them difficult to, to judge, like, how they're going to be at the next level. So that also, you know, you want to lower your risk a little bit. I had one question about the, the sort of – we used to call them scat backs, right? Like, the guys that are quick and mobile and, like – Darren Sproles, like Ladanian was a little Ooh. more two way. Uh, love Darren Sproles. Um, yeah. are there any teams in college that sort of run heavy screen games that are not kind of bubble screens these days? Because, like, I was thinking in the NFL, that still fits a, a mold that you're looking for because you want to you want to find ways to, to get kind of a, a running game that is still the passing game and gets your offensive linemen sort of moving forward. But I feel like that also is an element of risk. Like, I don't see many college offenses that are their heavy screen game outside of like wide receiver screens yeah I, I think the screen game initially came off of you know drop back pass get the defense to think pass you know maybe it's sort of like you can do a play action screen as well but the the drop back and then hit a, a running back on the screen it just isn't really part of the college game at this point they had to simplify it too much yeah and so that aspect i think is a little bit hard you'll still get a few maybe swing screens out to a running back occasionally you know let the receivers block for them but more of those traditional like slow screens that you used to see in the nfl you know that that doesn't happen and even like we talked about the chiefs earlier they're not running those old school slow screens a lot it's really unique you know throw it underhanded to a fullback as you're rolling out you know all, all sorts of weird stuff that they're doing that you know, is a, is a screen game, but not kind of the, the traditional. And so it's, it's tricky to maybe project that aspect of a running backs game for sure. You also, you also have the Niners that are throwing the ball just on the other side of the line of scrimmage, but that's usually after everything else has been cleared out and created space for them to get yak too. Yeah. So it's again, quite different. I'm, I'm smiling. Cause I'm remembering Ted, when we were in the room that, down at Miami, when they were prepping for, for Matt's Virginia team, and we we're just watching play after play where like the running back would would run out into the flat and there'd be no one within 10, 15 yards of him and would never even get a look. <laughs> and so I wonder if that's if that's sort of w- without asking you to to critique your own offense, Matt. Um, I, I like what are, what like what is the reason why that is sort of just sort of a, a Brendan, Brendan couldn't see to the sides. It's left handed quarterback. Can't see either side. You can only see <laughs> yeah. in the over the middle. Throw it <laughs> yeah. deep and over the middle. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think that's really an interesting thing. And one of the things that made Tom Brady great was his ability to check it down. Uh, and it was frustrating to watch as someone who is a Patrick Mahomes truther to say, you know, Tom Brady obviously is is the best ever and was a incredible quarterback. A, a huge number of his throws were to running backs in the flat check downs he his ability to just say i don't love what i'm seeing downfield i'm gonna throw it to a running back um was unparalleled uh for us you know we did end up hitting a lot of passes downfield um and instead of hitting a running back in the flat our quarterback would end up just scrambling and running um he was a really good runner he liked running and so that for him was kind of our, our check down. We still had our check down built into the play in case, you know, he was blitzed. And, and a lot of times it's like a hot route. If you get a blitz, you can throw it to the back right away instead of taking a sack. 
Uh, but for our quarterback, it was very much just if you don't like what you see downfield, run it. And that's, he would try and that's run really interesting over and, and perfectly accurate, right? Like because you're seeing more and more mobile quarterbacks, it's really important. Um, you know, whether that's Josh Allen, obviously you've got Lamar, you've got Mahomes. I mean, it's, it's a lot of them. And so if that's your check down as opposed to the the running back, like that again sort of devalues the position potentially versus what you'd have in the past. So I want to go back to we we've sort of danced around it, which is the separating of running back skill from offensive line and how we go about doing that. Like you mentioned, Ted, we're talking about like Saquon Barkley. Okay, say he's getting and I, I haven't I haven't I'll admit to not having dug into this this specific data, but say he's he's not getting as far before first contact. And that's that that's why his or any running back that we've seen year on year decreases because of that. How do we go about checking if that is something that, you know, a, a physical decline or some other, some kind of decline on the on the, the part of the running back or he's just that the holes aren't aren't what they were before? And and if they aren't, then maybe you think that 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 there's a there's a rebound there in a better system. I think this is another great example of how we could use our line battles data to talk about offensive line play for a while. It was uh, just nothing. Right. It was all running would be credited to a running back. They're great. They're amazing. I think the first thing that came up was talking about like offensive line yards and using just a threshold of any yardage gained on a run zero to four i think maybe the zero to three would be given to an offensive line at 100 percent, and then three to six is 50 percent, and then anything after would be running backs i think that's a pretty good proxy of you know as you're expecting an offensive line to block and get downfield in the block that's about where they get to you know on on some run plays but being able to talk about specifically using the line battles information how much movement is there? When does a, a offensive lineman stop blocking? You know, how many forced missed tackles is a running back having to create? Um, where does that come into play versus where an offensive line is? You know, what do these holes look like from a tracking data perspective? Like the amount of data that is available now is really can help with that conversation. Like run disruptions are effectively a pressure in the run game. And yeah. that that actually is something that we created off of the the tracking data that counts under havoc. But that's another one. So like, you know, how how well is the offensive line actually doing in the blocking space of the run game? We can evaluate that better than almost anything else. When you flip it back on the, the running back, like you can also see the size of the holes because you have tracking data, right? If you know where everybody's at, you can see the size of the holes. You can actually look at the vector information, which is some of the things that the big data bull have done. And so you're like, okay, not only is the hole big, but whatever they've done to create confusion in the backfield has sent you know the linebacker in a different vector. And so the expected run uh, rushing yards from this are bigger than expected. Then you bring it back to the running back and a bit like we have get off in the defensive line, like you can look at the running back from the moment that he's got the ball. What does it look like when he's hitting the line? Right. And you can, you can see kind of the, the acceleration, um, uh, curve around that you can see the top speed curve like how how quickly is he getting there how how many times is he having to change direction because you're getting in on a frame by frame basis um you know and then once it gets vertical like what does that look like as well i think that you get more granularity in the data space to be able to evaluate these players than you have ever before and a bit like last week when we were talking about you get a better ability to assign credit because of the quality and accuracy of the data that makes sense. And I'm, I'm the, the, the next thing is obviously, you know, you, you're, you're talking about change of directions and, and speed hitting the line and stuff like that. There's also sort of a vision element. So like if you, uh, uh, splatting into a, a place where there's no hole at full speed is probably better than splatting into that spot at half speed, but changing direction and getting to an opening is, is, uh, is better in most cases. I mean, maybe not the, not the Leroy Horde example, which is, you know, one of my favorite quotes of all time. You need uh, one yard, I'll get you three. You need five yards, I'll get you three. Um, is great uh, self-awareness there. Matt, uh, I, a, I think some of the work that's happened yeah. in our data science group from, from Abby and uh, directed by Dr. Will Morgan, who unfortunately is off to the Rajasthan Royals because he's a, he's a cricket freak. Uh, who, who, the cricket OG, loved cricket, just happened to be a weird Liverpool fan when I ran across him. But uh, anyway, he's he's leaving. But anyway, the, we've been classifying blocks, 
And like once you're able to classify block type, you can then look at how does this running back do in this particular scheme of rushes, right? Like you can start to, to take it down to that level and say, hey, he runs a lot in this type of, of rushing play. And this is what his, his production looks like. If we're good at that type, like maybe we can do even better than that. Yeah, I think that is what we were talking about a little bit earlier, where with the increase of data and tagged data across you know, both college and the NFL, you're able to really identify and dial into specific scheme elements, whether it's inside zone, outside zone, power. Um, you talked earlier about like the Blake Corum example and his offensive line. Uh, I think they had six offensive linemen at the NFL Combine this year, which just seems wild to think that every single one of their guys is, is at the Combine. Also, beware of um, you know Michigan next year having to replace a whole bunch of people. Just as a, an aside, in, in the gambling space, we looked at that as like one of the keys in the early season. Like, if you have a lot of OL turnover, like you probably want to be really careful about favorites in in early season. Like, that's a that's a danger point. Yeah. One more question to end is, you know, we've we've talked about this is not regarded as a great running back draft class. Um, but if you're looking in this year's draft for a running back that clears the bar of being good enough to be, you know, a, a featured part of, of, of an NFL offense, what traits, what abilities, what things are you are you focused on? Uh, and I'm, I'm I'm more thinking of sort of the, the the to the extent it's still a thing, the quote unquote every down back as opposed to the 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 more specialist. Yeah, I think the ability to make people miss to get yards after contact, you know, there, there are some things that will never change. A running back is going to be hit at some point, no matter how good you are at scheming up things. So the ability to not get tackled, I think is, is a big deal. And the ability to uh, catch the ball. I think you, you talked a little bit about the change in, they're not necessarily just third down backs. They have to be able to catch the ball at, at all times. Um, I think that is is another thing to really look at. The ability to play as much as possible and the ability to make people miss. I think those two things, um, based on, on my research and, and things that I've looked at, really translate well uh, to the next level. Our podcast yeah. producer was constantly posting Bijan Robinson highlights throughout the season. So I, I think he agrees with like the make people miss element. Yeah. Very exciting. Is the college game conducive to evaluating whether a running back will be a credible blocker? No. Okay. I think for a few reasons, <laughs> but they just, they just don't do it. They're not asked to do it a whole lot. Often, your stud guy will go to the sideline even at the college level and they'll bring in like a backup that's good at blocking so they just don't do it much you know what i feel like that's true across the breadth of the population but i also feel like when you get guys that like to block like you find some that are just like willing to face up on a blitzer um when especially when you know the the quarterback changes the protection i think when you find that like that actually is a little bit of relish a little bit of like enjoying the fight like those guys are are capable and interested, and you know they probably will spend a bit of time working on their technique as well. So they're willing. Uh, but most of, I think, for like 80, 90 percent of rushing or running backs, like it's tough to evaluate that because they just don't have to do it. I guess I'll I'll I'll, I'll end here with with the question of is is how much of a swing skill is that, or is it still primarily? Uh, you know, the the ability on the ball, if you will, whether in the pass game or or in the run game, or is that that ability to 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 pick up blitzers and whatnot in the passing game? Is that a to what degree is that a that a make or break skill for a lot of guys in this draft? I think because there are not that many, you know, high drafted picks, I, I don't think it's a make or break skill. You know, when you're taking a running back second, third round or, or later, you're really just banking on one or two skills. You're not thinking that they're going to be kind of a, a do-it-all guy. And so I, I don't think it's a make or break, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. A different way of framing the question is if if they were a credible blocker, how many rounds would that move their evaluation up? Like, Which is kind of the way that you're looking at it from a draft perspective. 
I don't think we know because we don't have anybody in the front office here. But it's, it's, it's a good way to good way to ask the question. Yeah, well, I, I can't think of any. So yeah. Since none of us have a good answer for, for that one, uh, that's probably a good spot to end for the week. Uh, thanks, as always, for listening. And uh, Ted or Matt, you got anything else you want to sign off on? Matt, uh, you're, you, uh, you, you are required to try a new Mountain Dew flavor uh, before for next week and give us a, a thorough review. You got it. I, Seth kept saying things of that nature in the podcast while we were walking, or not the podcast, but the combine where we were walking through all of our meetings. And every single time I'm like, Crab Rangoon. Right there, crab rangoon, <laughs> things of that nature. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> oh, I'm Stephen A. Smith brain. Uh, thanks for listening. Take care, everyone.